Kelly at home helping us out. Um, all right, I've I've switched to a different Wi-Fi. I don't know if that has uh, <laughs> Kelly think, is saying it's too many red oaks. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. I so can, it, must, yeah. it must must have been an internet issue. Um, all right. Well, should we just take it from the top? Because uh, if they couldn't hear it, then there's no doubt that uh, that first part is not going to be captured by the StreamYard service. Perfect. So. Let's do it. <clears throat> All right, folks, welcome to another edition of the Pack Pride Weekly Podcast. <laughs> All right, well, uh, condensed version of the, uh, the, right the condensed version, uh, we're going to re- record a, a rather quick show here, uh, an even quicker show now that the first half did not get uh, <laughs> captured by the StreamYard. Uh, we appreciate everybody being patient with the audio issues there at the beginning of the show. We are here at Medios. Uh, and you know, it's a lovely time of year, no better time to want to sit outside and enjoy your uh, fine Amedia's cuisine out on the patio space. And they've really done it up well. They've got some lovely new flowers, red and white flowers there. Uh, everything is clean, nice, neat. And, uh, there's no better time again, this time of year to, uh, to catch, uh, some games. They got a, a big screen TV, at least one, I think two TVs perhaps as well. the Amedeo's patio. So take advantage of that. Ask for it when you come here. If you want to sit outside, they will get you taken care of. Um, Corey, how are you doing, sir? <laughs> the, the golf clap, golf clap, fitting after the Masters this past weekend. No. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, finally feeling almost recovered, I guess, from the past week. Okay. Uh, still, <laughs> uh, honestly, man, like all the way up until Friday, I was still kind of jet. Uh, just because of just a wild month, like time didn't always change the entire time, but just like all the travel, all the time change there, the last two trips, uh, it was just a, a wild month, but man, you know, getting, getting to spend a weekend with the family, getting to spend a weekend doing some yard work was nice. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as, as, as always, uh, getting back to North Carolina, getting to chat up with Scott Wood every once in a while. That's about, right. home lending team because is there anything this man can't do because after a successful career at NC State and playing professional basketball Scott has turned his sights on conquering the mortgage world reach out to him today if you're interested in the purchase or build of your dream home looking to purchase your first investment property or even just to buy land great rates in 50 states he's got that virtually unlimited room The ability to lend in all 50 states. Scott is looking forward to sending out those pre approvals and getting your home journey started. Yep. Uh, uh, squeeze. Is that one in there really quick? Yeah. So we can get straight to the football or the basketball content and then football content. Yes. Yes. Um, and I, and I am, uh, noticing that my video feeds dipping, uh, a couple of times. So again, and apologies in advance if, uh, some of the audio is not coming through clear on you guys' end, uh, you know, you folks in the chat are very helpful. No, Kelly heard the ad read. Fine. It's inside. Too much. Yeah, let's start with the wins. That sounds great. I mean, the, the run they had, uh, I hated that I wasn't a part of any of it. I mean, I wasn't able to be present for any of it, obviously watching from afar. Uh, we had Brian Pertle that was helping us with uh, the women's basketball coverage. He had, he had helped us all season long, uh, gave us great content. Feature off, uh, you know. I think everybody gets caught up in the the men's run and and what they were able to accomplish. But for the women, this is the second time in program history they've ever made the Final Four. Right. Uh, first time since 1998. Uh, Isaiah James was unbelievable during this run. Uh, we got to see you know just how important uh, River Baldwin was this, was to this team throughout the run as well. Um, I hated that Mimi Collins wasn't able to 
ever really get going. And Matty Hayes kind of took a step back a little bit offensively uh, throughout this run. Uh, so I feel like if, if the two of the Thunders, you know, maybe this team. game uh the way that finished uh it wasn't you know uh the the, <laughs> the third quarter of that game wasn't great uh similar to the way that things went against purdue in the second half uh but man you know just an unbelievable run for them and, and what they're able to accomplish and and put you know together before next season too because uh you know that you're getting all of those guards back the only two players you're losing mimi collins river ball when maddie hayes uh, has already said she's planning on coming back mm -hmm. uh now they get a chance to go out and and say hey you have a chance to be river ball in the system to a to a transfer you have a chance to be mimi collins in the system to a transfer and try to go put their best foot forward to get those players and then have another year of experience of the players that you already have and the recruits that they have coming in which is uh insane uh, Zam Jones and, and Devin Quigley coming in, two top 50 guards. Uh, they have a chance to, uh, you know, I, I know they made the Final Four. I know they were ranked inside the top 10, so it sounds weird to even say this, but they have a chance to be have a more complete roster next season mm -hmm. if they go out and, and get the right players in the transfer portal. Yeah, and, and just real quick, I'll, I'll mention I did just switch to uh, a mobile hotspot, so hopefully that will eliminate some of the um, you know skipping in audio. I was seeing some comments about audio issues continuing on, so hopefully uh, we'll use that as a remedy, but uh, as always, weigh in in the chat and let us know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it's it's uh, It did feel like it, there were times um, as good as this team was, as, as well as they performed, you know, uh, it did feel like there were – you could definitely see opportunities for improvement uh, mm -hmm. and, and you know, there were places where you could maybe add some pieces on the roster that would fix certain issues. Um, you know, rebounding at times seemed like it was a little bit of a struggle. Um, and, uh, you know, I just feel like, uh, you know, uh, you can never have enough shooters. Uh, what Isaiah James did there in the tournament, especially in that Texas game, incredible. I mean, to get them into the final four, um, you know, it's uh, it's just, you know, you can't really lean on that. And, and as we saw on the men's side, you know, sometimes the shooting goes cold and, and it, you um, you get bounced from a single elimination tournament. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm excited about the, the possibilities. Certainly Wes has shown the uh, capacity to, you know, keep players engaged who want to stay here and bring in talent who wants to be here. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to switch these because I'm realizing as I'm looking over at you that it's, uh, okay. it's weird <laughs> on your end. I don't know if, if people are seeing that on y'all's end too. but uh, <laughs> So the big thing I'll say about, about the women's team was, again, you know, going into the year, nobody expected uh, for this team to be as complete as it was. Uh, and I think that gives you some pretty good insight into the fact that, you know, Westmore is able to build a team – a whole lot better than what we saw, you know, the previous season. Uh, I think a lot of people kind of went into last season going, all right, this, you know, they've got all these players back, Jada Boyd, Jakia Brown-Turner, uh, Diamond Johnson. These, you know, this team is going to be elite mm -hmm. two seasons ago. And instead you had a bunch of, you know, not to call any of those players selfish, but you had a lot of unselfish players on this roster that bought in and said, hey, we're going to be good enough. We're going to be good enough to beat UConn at the beginning of the season. We're going to be good enough to, you know, to make a run, uh, not only the ACC tournament, but the NCAA tournament. They were a top 10 team for much of the season. I feel like still deserving of probably a top two seed, but the loss to Notre Dame uh, right before you get to Selection Sunday changed that a little bit for, for NC State. Uh, so maybe the run's a little bit different if, if that changes. Uh, but running up against Texas, beating a, a very, very good Texas team uh, and beating a very, very good Stanford team uh, in that mix, you know, to even make it to the Elite Eight, to make it to the Final Four. Uh, I mean, you know, the body of work right now for, for Wes Moore uh, proves that he can consistently get there. Yeah. You, know, you look back at the fact that this is the second Elite Eight in the last three years. Uh, it shows that this team is good enough to get to that point. Now they want to be able to get to that breakthrough moment, get to that national championship game, and uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to put all the eggs in one basket, but this feels like a, you know, next season feels like a year to to really make that run, to really, you know, load up in the portal as much as you can and find the best players because, 
doesn't sound like a lot of players are planning on leaving. It sounds like the, the rest of this roster is planning on sticking around. Uh, you've got two very, very good freshmen coming in. Go out and get some elite bigs to add to this roster, and they have a very good chance to not only be a powerhouse in the ACC next season, but be a powerhouse in, in, you know, in national, um, in nationally next season as well is what I was trying to get to. Right, yeah. But Notre Dame's going to be very good next season as well. So. Yeah, I mean, and no reason to think that the ACC won't be, if not the best, one of the best, you know, conferences. Um, so they'll be tested for sure. And um, can't, can't imagine that they'll be picked to finish preseason as low as they were this year. But, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I think that uh, Wes has certainly, again, proven that uh, he'll have his team ready regardless of where they get picked in the preseason. And, you know, it's funny, I, I think we felt like two years ago that – that roster had everything that you needed and the chemistry just didn't quite work. Yeah. So, you know, as we talk about adding pieces in the portal, I think every coach now has the, the challenge of not just adding, you know, who, who, who are the most talented pieces, but, you know, will this talented piece fit and mesh with the pieces that we already have? And um, so that's um, as much as, talent acquisition it's it's you know talent uh evaluation from the standpoint of you know does the chemistry work you want to make sure that whoever you bring in um fits uh, for lack of a better term it's it's it it says you know this run and the the men's run felt like both were so predicated heavily on just uh, the team all pulling in the same direction all on the same page and like you said unselfish just doing whatever was needed for each person to pitch in and and it can be hard to to find you know five six seven eight you know girls or guys who are willing to do that uh, for both rosters. So I can't say who it is right now, but we got a question. We Johnny was asking about a Baylor big uh, that that West recruited out of the portal. Um, that sounds like they've they try to make contact. Doesn't sound like there's been a ton of interest there. We'll see. Uh, but there are two players currently. One that they're on a. A Zoom call with right now, I believe, uh, before they head over to the bell tower, and then um, another one that will actually be taking an official visit this week. Uh, I'll have some, you know, some scoop on that in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be writing it up tonight after the bell tower celebration and everything. So uh, just be on the lookout for that. I'll just I'll throw that out there as a, a little, you know, egg for people to look for tomorrow morning. Yeah, we'll yeah. also have sixty percent off uh, deal starting tomorrow because of the transfer portal. So. Nice. Another, another little piece for everybody. You should enter your name into the portal of joining uh, the Pack Pride uh, membership ranks. You tried so hard with that. And it, <laughs> it almost went so well. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of I was thinking about it, a lot of consistencies and, and similarities between the two runs. Um, and uh, another one would be uh, the fact that um, you know, for the the men's and the women's side, you know, you had these uh, running into two teams with elite big. Bigs, um, yeah. you know Camille Cordoza for South Carolina. Um, she just was incredible, uh, and you know she proved it in the the following game against Iowa. Um, so you know I, I feel like there's no shame when you you are beaten by a better team, and South Carolina proved it that night. Um, that third quarter obviously was just you know unreal, unreal, uh, yeah. and 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 it's uh, you know you talk about teams being scary uh, that. That was South Carolina, perhaps at its scariest, where it just proved to you that it can not only score at will on the other end, but shut you down in the process. And oh, yeah. that's how you you get uh, you get you know run over. Um, so again, no shame in losing to the eventual national champion there. And then on the men's side, if we can switch th to there. Um, oh, I, I, one other similarity you mentioned: Wes zooming uh, uh, potential portal prospect uh right before we head over to the the bell tower it certainly doesn't help your efforts when you're heading into the per portal and looking for folks uh to be able to say um you know that uh hey we're uh, you know the def uh defending acc champion as it is relates to the men's side but yeah. uh you know to, uh, a final four team you know it's kind of proof of concept for both programs that uh yeah you know when we when we get it going uh anything's possible so yeah exactly um, so on the men's side, you know, the, again, speaking of elite big men, you run into Zach Eady. I, f I felt like NC state did a, an excellent job defending him, uh, mm -hmm. held him to, I think his lowest point total in the tournament, one of his lower point totals of the entire season. 
Um, Which was still 20 points. <laughs> yeah, still 20 points. And uh, yeah. But I, th- I think I heard that he only went to the free throw line for two attempts, which, you know, he got so many of his points this year from the free throw line. Um, he still drew some pretty ticky-tack fouls, but they just weren't on shooting fouls. But, yeah, I right. mean, it, you know, to, to and, and one of them, I mean, one of the fouls that DJ Burns had was within the first minute, and it was in transition, which was just a weird case. But, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, you, you, you limited some of the ways in which Zach Eadie was uh, was beating teams. Um, and, you know, it. You know, you credit uh, the game plan on the NC State part to, to limit Z, uh, Zach Eadie's uh, ability to hurt you. And then you also tip your cap to Purdue for being able to hit some of the shots that were that were open, and again more so of what than what Purdue did. It's what NC State didn't do, and that was on the shooting side of things. Um, you know, you really um, didn't see the ball go in the basket like it had been, you know, throughout the ACC tournament and then the NCAA tournament previously. Um, you know, uh, there's always the immediate talking point about shooting in a football stadium versus a an actual basketball arena. I don't know that that made a huge difference. It certainly didn't impact Purdue's ability to shoot. Um, so it's probably an overmade, you know, the, the discussion around that's probably uh, overblown. But, um, you know, you, you hate that Casey Morsell uh, turned in an O for performance in his last, yeah. uh, t- you know, time taking the court for NC State. And there were some other – uh, open uh, opportunities that were just missed. Um, so it's, it's just a magical run that, that came to an end because just simply the ball didn't go in the basket. Yeah, and I mean, you know, another thing I'll point out too, and I I, I mean, I feel like if Michael O'Connell was in that game, uh, it changes yeah. the complete complexion of that game. I mean, you know, they, they both got off to pretty good starts at the beginning. Uh, O'Connell, just a freak injury. I mean, it was just very weird in transition – all of a sudden comes up limp. I was like, oh, maybe it's just a – it looked – honestly, like, looking at it courtside, it looked like a hamstring. It was just like, yeah. okay, well, it's just – you know, it's a probably just a, a pulled muscle. He's going to go back out, you know, go get some treatment or a cramp or something along those lines and never never was able to really come back in. He came back in for a couple seconds uh, there at the end of the first half and then just wasn't himself. And uh, you could see the frustration uh, – from him afterwards and you know the frustration from the rest of the team not towards him but just the frustration of knowing like we could have you know that could have been a much different game if he was in that um but it does sound like i have a question here from amy it's uh you know have we heard if moc is okay yes um it does sound like he's okay it was it was honestly just a minor injury it wasn't something where you know, it would have kept him out for another game or something like that. Like, he probably, if they find a way to win that game, he probably plays on Monday night yeah. uh, from from the sounds of it. But uh, just, again, you know, that's just that it was, sometimes happens. Yeah, it, it from the replays they showed, it looked like his foot just kind of skipped out from underneath him and he ended up kind of hyperextending his leg yeah. a, a bit. And, uh, yeah, you're right. It, it's it's a It's a – you know, a freak accident, a freak injury in, in some respects. And you're right, you know, him not being on the court after he had played so well during this run, uh, his his absence certainly was felt. It it probably put more of the onus back on, you know, a guy like DJ Horn to, to run the point. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, the offense had just found itself with Mike out on the floor and with him not being out there. You know, it, it's hard to say specifically what he – would have given you or what he was lacking, but it's, you know, if you'd watched the prior nine games, you would have known that his, his absence was felt. Yeah, and I mean, again, I think it goes to show the importance of, of every single one of these players uh, throughout this run, too, because, you know, it wasn't just Michael O'Connell. If you had lost, I mean, if you had lost Casey Morsell, you would have lost a, a great defensive cog, even though he wasn't a great offensive player in that game. Yeah. Um, if you had lost, you know, Mo Diara, uh, that would have been – you saw how, how much they struggled to kind of get past um, – you know, not to say they it struggled to get past Duke, uh, but you saw how much they struggled to be able to get, you know, rebounds and things along those lines against Duke because he wasn't uh, playing. You see other players step up at times. Michael O'Connell had 11 rebounds in that game against Duke. But, you know, it just – again, I think it goes back to show you – the importance of every single one of these players on this run. Yeah. Uh, every single one of them was important. Not in every single game, you know. Again, uh, you know, at times Casey Morsell would dip off. At times Jaden Taylor would dip off. At times, you know, DJ Horn 
had good had really really strong games in some of the some of the bigger games the moments they really needed him but it's just again it goes to show you just how important every single one of them was to this and and how important it is to get a lot of these guys back too and and the same thing we were just talking about from the women's standpoint you know this this men's team Kevin Keats his staff need to go out there and go get you know you, you know exactly what you need you need not to say you need a DJ Horn but you need a high volume high scoring guard they brought in uh, Ryan Conwell Jr. Over the, or Ryan Conwell over the weekend to try to get that. Don't know if they're going to end up landing him, but uh, there are some other guards that haven't entered the transfer portal as of right now that they're still looking at and still hoping to to go after. Uh, Dontre Styles enters the transfer portal today. Sounds like they're they're very high on him as well. Um, and then another player uh, they've already added, Brandon Hunt, ha- Brandon Huntley Hatfield. Uh, they've already got in the mix to help replace DJ Burns. Again, I don't think you're going to replace right. DJ right. Burns. But you now have a three big lineup that have all produced at the ACC level. Have all produced in the well, I don't know if Brendan Huntley Hatfield hasn't had a chance to produce in the postseason, but you have two <laughs> that have produced in the postseason. Mm-hmm. Huntley Hatfield would love to be able to uh, in the near future. So you've already gone out and got, you know, a big that you you really need for next season. Uh, and it sounds like, despite some you know outside concerns that that Mo Diara might be looking at you know at staying in France, uh, it doesn't sound like that's necessarily the case. Uh, there were some rumors going around, and that's not to say that he won't. But uh, as of right now, it sounds like there's a a, a pretty high confidence. I, I mentioned it last week in one of my stories, and I said, you know, as of right now, it sounds like a 60% chance that he will come back. Um, not necessarily a coin flip. Uh, that I, I do feel like he's leaning towards coming back to NC State. And, and as of right now, I still think he is. Uh, so that would be a big get for NC State just to get the guys back. Uh, so getting him back, getting uh, some other players back, and then it sounds like right now they're trying to get uh, Dontre Styles in as quickly as possible uh, before other teams come come <laughs> right. looking at him. A guy that averaged you know over 12 points per game last season and uh, was a very productive three-point shooter this past season too over at Georgetown, ha- would have a chance to come in and kind of fill that role that Casey Morsell had this past season, uh, along with some other guys in this mix, too. I mean, you know, I don't want to linger too long on this, but do you feel like shooting is, like, the top need? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean. I mean, because you do get you, you get Jaden Taylor back, I'd love to see them change him into a driver next season as opposed to being an outside shooter. He's an excellent defender. If you're able to shift him over to being a driver – it's a guy that's a very efficient free throw shooter, um, can drive to the basket as well, can hit some outside shots to, to you know draw defenders out, uh, but he has a great chance to be that. Michael O'Connell has a more established role already, uh, so you need a guy at that two spot uh, that can play that comfortably, that can be a shooter, and if you need, you know, every once in a while can play that combo guard spot as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine, you know, you mentioned – you know, Mo ha- might have options to you know play professionally, but it doesn't, s- doesn't sound like it, or the indications aren't leading that way right at the moment. But uh, are any other potential uh, exits via the portal, or is, or is most of this team going to try to stay together? Yeah, you've already had L.J. Thomas leave. You've already had um, Cam um, Woods. Cam um, Woods leave as well, um, and then you know uh, uh, Alex not only left uh, last week, but he was not a a, a scholarship player. Um, you know, the one concern, and I mentioned this on our, our board last week, is is probably MJ Rice. Right. Um, but it does sound like, you know, if, if, if Kevin Keats had his way, he'd like to keep him uh, at this point. Don't know exactly what the future holds there. Uh, and again, you know, you're going out and you're recruiting a guy like Dontrez Styles. That's going to probably play that three or four position. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where you have uh, MJ Rice slotted at right now. So, they're probably just saying, look, we don't we don't know exactly what the future looks like, whether or not you're planning on staying here. We have to recruit this position. Uh, so they're going to go out and recruit it like they have him. But at the same time, you know, they don't know exactly where that that starter role is going to be next season. So I'd love to see MJ Rice return. I think he has a chance to be a very special player. Uh, it's just, you know, a lot of it right now is off the court, not on the court for him. And, you know, that that's that's best left to, to him and his family. I'm never going to touch on that, but uh, you know, right now I think uh, the best thing for NC State to do is is to try to recruit uh, like you need that spot 
because you don't know if you're going to have him back for next season. Yeah. Well, I can see over your shoulder our, our guest for the second part of the show is in there, but I just wanted to, to mention real quick before we transition. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't know that we'll fully know just how impactful these two runs were for these two programs until years down the road, but yeah. uh, just an amazing um, ride for all the NC State fans and the ability, you know, the, the New York Times calling us the epicenter of college basketball, <laughs> uh, you know, it just – the 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 excitement the joy the you know um everything surrounding both programs it felt so good to have that level of uh enjoyment positivity excitement um and i'm so glad that you got a chance to go to to phoenix and cover it and be there it, you know just i know so many nc state fans were there to hear the wolfpack chant coming from uh, I'm, and i know is a massive arena there were probably what 70 or 80 thousand people that was, there that was like bone chilling like yeah. it was yeah, I mean, it, it's that and then the red when they screamed. Right. The, uh, the red, national white, anthem. Yeah, it was just. Yeah. Whew. So, I mean, I, I just I'm so happy for everyone uh, who's associated with the school uh, that got to be a part of that. And we only hope the best for uh, the um, you know fallout from these two final four runs for both programs. All right. Well, let's bring on our guest to talk uh, a little football here in the second part of the show. Um Michael, how are you, sir? The one and doing great. Michael how are y'all? Move up Good. Bit. How are you doing, sir? Doing great. Thanks for having me, as always. Hope y'all are well. Appreciate you uh, taking some time and, and hanging out with us. Uh, you know, in the midst of the Final Four runs, uh, there was a little uh, spring football that took place, and um, – you know, there were jokes made, I'm sure, uh, around uh, Dave Dorn's comments about uh, what Steve Smith had to say about uh, the program. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, for for a moment there, NC State was a basketball school in the midst of doing football things. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure Dave didn't mind too much. He, he seemed like he was enjoying uh, those moments that he got to take in at the uh in the final four or no the uh acc tournament and and in the ncaa tournament but yeah i was gonna say he was at the elite eight he was he was screaming wagon wheel with the rest of the crowd so (laughs) yeah yeah um so again michael thank you for joining us uh you know what are uh you know i I think uh there were a lot of state fans that were excited to see what they saw during the spring game um but michael's our one michael's our one representative (laughs) Yeah, you, the, uh, I was only there was only two representatives there in of the entire media. There was two people <laughs> yeah. in the press box. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it's pretty vacant there. Um, <laughs> and I stayed but, till um, the end, so not patting myself on the back, but I was there the entire time. <laughs> oh, damn. But um, but yeah, uh, give us kind of your read on. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you want to talk about spring practice and as a broader concept or start at the the football game, but. Uh, uh, what were some of your takeaways from the spring practice? Segment well, I think I think your hope is that maybe you can piggyback off this basketball momentum a little bit, um, because I think everybody would agree who follows NC State football closely that given what's returning and what you added in the portal, the resources you poured into the program, expect and a manageable schedule, expectations are sky high. Um, I think a conference championship competing for that is is the goal is goal number one and then trying to you know with the playoff expanding to 12 try to slide in that playoff if at all possible there's some questions like everybody across the country has questions right now but i think nc state roster wise has a lot more answers than questions so that is um that is a, a reason for optimism the spring game if we hit on that uh, similar to last year, you had a lot of first-team guys going against third-team guys, and that makes it really hard to get a read on – a true read on things. But what I can say is NC State is, it upgraded significantly in the skill spots, regardless of who was on the field defensively. Um, you have guys other than Kevin Conception who can make plays, and I think that is the biggest thing because we've seen in the past you know, three, four years, you can be great on defense. That's only going to get you so far. Uh, you've got to be able to score points. Um, to get to the next level. And I think this team has the potential. Offensive line a little concerning. I think they have the potential, though, to be a high-scoring, high-powered, however you want to wear it type of offense. Yeah, and I mean, you you released your uh, your five, you know, stock-up players immediately afterwards. Uh, there were several that were mentioned in there. Uh, I wanted to talk about the QB position, though, because going into this, I think a lot of people said, all right, well, you know, back in January, it's like, okay, well, you got uh, you got Grayson McCall. All right, do you have a backup quarterback? 
do you have somebody that you feel comfortable with? Uh, and I, I think after watching the spring game and I think after hearing everything we heard out of spring camp, uh, people feel pretty comfortable with, uh, with C.J. Bailey potentially being that backup guy uh, going into the season. Do you see them still going out and getting somebody? And how comfortable do you feel like everybody is uh, with, the, you know, with where uh, the quarterback position is right now with Grayson and, and C.J. being there? Well, I think everybody expected Grayson McCall to step in and, and be really good, and he was throughout spring ball. I think what kind of separates him is the accuracy, uh, just really, really accurate at Coastal, 70% completion percentage during his career, 88 touchdowns to 14 interceptions. I mean, those are off the charts. Now, I know that it's group of five competition, but I would argue that he's never had the type of skill uh, players and he is, you know, that he's going to have this year. I mean, you have legit playmakers all over the place, so – I think the kids starting with him, I think he's going to be really good. They've got to keep him healthy. Um, that's going to fall on the offensive line. But, you know, going to the, the second string quarterback, it's a really tough sell. And I think what you're going to see across college football is it's going to be harder and harder to keep four scholarship quarterbacks on the roster. I mean, quarterbacks these days, if they're not playing, they get pissed off and they leave. That's not just in Raleigh, that's everywhere. And they think the grass is always greener. Well, it's a tough sell now because you have, you know, who the starter is. And you have a guy, maybe the most talented freshman, should I say, physically, the tools, one of the most, if not the most talented freshman in avian program history. I mean, this kid, the things he can do with the football, you just don't see players who are 18 years old or are supposed to be in high school make the type of strides he made while knowing probably less than half of the offense. I mean, he is everything that you're looking for. Uh, but how do you sell that to somebody in the transfer portal? You can come in and compete to be the backup against somebody who's significantly more talented than you. You're going to probably lose that and end up being third team. You're never going to start. I mean, they're not, they wouldn't say that to a kid, but that's essentially what you're looking at because you're, if, if you're in the portal as a quarterback right now, more than likely you can't get on the field where you are and, and you're going into a really tough situation at NC State. So why ideally would they like to add somebody with experience long story short i don't know if it's really realistic and is it good i would ask y'all y'all follow it closely to just bring somebody in to fill a spot when you have other needs on the roster um that i think would benefit from maybe adding a pe- another piece he did have that one overthrow to kc which was in the first <laughs> half which is a little concerning uh but then you know threw a dime to wesley grimes on the very next play so that worked out pretty well yeah, um, yeah, Mike. I I want to get your take on his throwing ability because it seemed like um, I was really impressed with his ability to change velocity on some of his throws. Like there were, there was one I'm thinking of, uh, like a crossing route where he just absolutely lasered it right into the get the belly of the receiver. I'm not sure if it was Concepcion or if it was another receiver. I want to uh, say that was probably Noah. If you, maybe uh, Noah across, or no, it was, I think it was Joe Lee actually across the. Middle yeah, I think you're right. Guys defending him, yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to be a massive weapon for both quarterbacks. Yeah. It's probably flying under the radar. Uh, this that kid's got a chance to be big time in states off. Yeah. So that didn't, didn't but even. But he, he looked him. like he also had the ability to throw it with touch as well. So uh, you know, I, I'm I'm I was excited about that. I, I wouldn't be necessarily well, surprised that a talented freshman had the ability to really you know drill a ball, but to be able to do both to to throw it uh, accurately with speed and then also drop well, it into places on the the field seems impressive. Yeah, and I think one of the bigger plays of the game was on the first drive he was in against the first team defense he takes off and runs for almost 70 yards and you're talking about a kid who's six six you know still needs to obviously gain weight um but he is probably would have been a touchdown if it was a two-hand touch yeah uh can really (laughs) can move and people often talk about experience but that has changed so much you're talking about a kid who was a three-year starter at one of the best programs in the country also played for one of the best seven on seven teams in the country he has a lot of reps under his belt, and I'm not saying it's against ACC competition, but this kid, um, he's – you know, quarterbacks are just so much more advanced now. You can pretty much see if a guy can play very, uh, pretty quickly at any level, and I think it's clear he can play. The en- early enrollment gives him a nine, eight-month head start per se, so I can't imagine – you know, could he hit some type of freshman wall and struggle in fall camp? Sure, he can probably have some ups and downs, but the progress he's made, uh, I just think – it's it's really one of the bigger you know storylines of spring ball um, because I you just don't see it and everybody you talk to that that's the buzz and I think the more important thing was you go out there and you watch the spring game and he's doing the things you heard about now does he miss a play here and there absolutely he's eighteen so um, most kids would look 
uh, bad in that situation against, right. you know, <laughs> the first team defense and then being able to throw a catchable football. That's so important because we've seen quarterbacks yeah. in the past who can, yeah, a lot of them can, you know, throw with velocity, but you've got to be able to throw receivers open and put your playmakers in a position to make those plays. NC State has struggled mightily on offense at times over the past couple of years. And again, defense in the current era of college football can only get you so far. State, I think, finally has the pieces where you don't have to go 12 to 14 plays, 70 yards. You, you can you have the potential to get quick scores. Casey added that last year. Now you have multiple guys. I really think you pair the quarterbacks with the receivers. And, again, Jordan Waters, who has the look of an all-ACC player. We saw him last year. I, I think there's a lot of optimism. A one – you know, question right now is the offensive line. And I don't think it has to be great, but it needs to be pretty good, I think, to compete for a conference championship. All right. So we're going to have the, – the good part is we still have, what, four months to discuss? What it's hype season. Everybody ball. feels great. Everybody's undefeated right now. So, you know, before, right before we even get to fall camp. Uh, so give me your biggest takeaway that you learned from – spring camp on the offensive and the defensive side of the football. I'm just going to give you a broad overview. I think offensively, the skill players who somewhat or some are unproven, I think progressed rapidly. We know Noah Rogers is talented. Wesley Grimes yeah. has played Summit Wake, battled injuries last year, went healthy, and just the overall progression of probably the receiver group. To Corey Collins obviously was at state last year. A lot of buzz about him. When was the last time State had three outside receivers who are legit guys? And I think that's what you have. You saw it in the spring game. I guess it was get some reserves. You pair those with KC. And we haven't even gotten to Jonathan Paler yet, uh, who will be arriving. That He's going to play in some form or fashion, no doubt. Uh, Terrell Anderson. I, mean, I go down the list of all the players who seem to progress. You would. I don't think you typically expect that. But I think when you're recruiting guys, whether it's in high school, or the portal, you have to trust your evaluations, and sometimes you're going to miss. It doesn't appear that NC State has missed on these guys, and I think that mm -hmm. is is the most important thing. Defensively, um, you go to the spring game, it was really who didn't play. That was the storyline, but, I mean, again, there's no reason to stick guys like Aiden White out there. They, they, there's not – Davin Van, they don't have anything to prove. I think the depth at corner is really big for State. Brandon Cisse is, a, you know, I think a future All-ACC player at corner. You pair him with a potential All-American candidate in Aiden White. You have Corey Cola. You have three high-level, really, really high-level corners. And I don't think State's had that in a, in a while. I think you've had guys who are good. But these guys seem to be – you have three who are really good. And what you can do is so valuable. You know, if in the past, if Shaheen Battle or Aiden White were to get beat, you can't bring them over the sideline and talk to them about what happened because you have to keep them out there. They played so many snaps. snaps. In this situation, I think corner is going to be a real team strength. And, and I think that is, is so important because it takes a lot of pressure off of a fairly new group of linebackers. You lost a lot of production there. And – they're going to have to make up for some mistakes. You know, Peyton Wilson erased some mistakes last year, many, many mistakes for other people. You're going to probably have to lean on those corners on the outside, which is and it's incredibly tough to play corner. So hard. But we know what Aiden White can do. Brandon Cisse has the potential, like I said, is a, is a Sunday player by all accounts. I know he's got to prove it. And then Corey Coley and then buzz on Jackson Vick, which is great. That That's a fourth corner. Uh, off the charts athlete, be his third year in the program, I believe. That's typically if you you know in past interviews with Thunder, when you see guys make that jump who who mm -hmm. showed promise early on, it's typically that third spring right before their what is the red shirt sophomore year. He said there's just a pattern there that he's seen throughout his career, and I think that's good. I think it's really good. I think it's encouraging to have guys in the portal, but at the same time, it, it's becoming a just. Let, you're seeing less and less of actual development, and, and I think that is, is encouraging to see a guy like him really come on because I think what we're seeing now is for the foreseeable future, by my count, I, I did a story that I know we're going to run it tomorrow, Corey and, and James. We've got 24, State has 24 prep signees, 13 transfers. You're probably going to add a couple more. I mean, half your team essentially is going to be new, and I, I think that is – it's hard to wrap your brain around that um, but that's kind of where we're headed, I think, for NC State long-term. For them to remain competitive and 90% of college football to remain competitive, that's kind of the approach you're going to have to have heavy portal 
the other 10%, the national powers are going to be able to do what they're going to do, whatever they want to do. But again, I like what state's doing and I'm encouraged by, you know, especially those two things. And there's others we could go into, but um, like I said, those are the, the main takeaways for me. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, defensively, uh, it, it, you know, you mentioned having to fill the, the, you know, lack of production when Peyton Wilson, you know, leaves your roster. Uh, and, and much like there are no DJ Burns is out there in the portal. There's, there's not many people that can uh, replace a Peyton Wilson yeah. uh, production wise, but going to be a collective um, effort and nobody's replacing yeah. him. So I, I think that's the thing. And, you know, by question, I think everybody is, is, You've leaned on the defense so much is that it would be, I think, refreshing for everybody if you didn't have to the pressure that's been on their shoulders the past three years to really, you know, be that anchor. And I hope my hope is there's more of a balance this year. As long as Tony Gibson, I would argue he was the biggest piece they added in the offseason. What I mean, that's kind of Tony Cheek, but he signed an extension. As yeah, long as he's there and the transfer portal is what it is for NC State and you know, one pack and Savage was, I mean, those are the people that really deserve a ton of credit because the talent they were able to bring in are guys that have pro have proven themselves. And then guys that, you know, you feel really good about. There's a good combination and it, it feels glaring holes. Um, you got a guy like Cam Riley who can come in for Peyton Wilson. Is he Peyton Wilson? Absolutely not. But he is a, what, fifth year player, Auburn 6'5", 240 pounds. He can help you. Donovan Kaufman comes in, you know, that, that is a big help. Another Auburn transfer. He'll be here in, what, a month. That fills a hole with Devin Boykin recovering. I mean, there's so many good things with everything that's bad about the portal that are going to help NC State become, you know, or try to buy to be a, you know, playoff or a conference team. Because without the portal, that that group of schools is so small. It feels like now, it's never going to level the playing field, but it feels like now, with going to 12, and if you're smart in the portal and you have good, a good collective, you really can put yourself in good position for at least to, to compete for one of those spots. And at the end of the day, that's all you can hope for. Yeah, yeah, and that's one thing I was going to ask you about, too. Actually, I wanted to bring up Kelly's point here. He said, I think a plus this season is Dave Doran's been through the quote-unquote big expectations offseason a couple of years ago and has the experience to help this team over the summer when expectations begin to grow. Because now that we've moved on from basketball, yes, people are kind of going, oh, yeah, that's right. NC State football got, you know, 13 transfers, uh, got a ton of guys that they feel really good about uh, going into this year and can all help them uh, right away. Uh, do you feel like this was, you know, Michael, do you, I mean, we, we've talked about this, so I, I kind of know your answer, but I wanted you to be able to talk about it. Do you feel like this is an all-in season for NC State? This is a, hey, we can, we can not only add the players to make this happen, but we have the players coming back that, make, that can make this happen. The KCs of the world, the, you know, obviously you're getting, you know, four of five uh, starters from last season that are coming back on the offensive line. You add a ton of guys uh, as far as position players on the offense. You get back a Davin Van. You get back Trevally Price that you feel really good about. Uh, and then, you know, all the secondary players. Does this feel like an all-in season given especially the schedule that they have moving forward? Yeah, I, I don't know how it's not. And I think, you know, a couple of years ago when you had all the hype around that, you were relying mainly on homegrown players and guys that you had brought along and developed. And, you know, there were some holes there. You know, I think that there's going to be holes on every roster with the exception of maybe Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia, you know, that. But I think what you do now is with the transfer portal, and some of the development in program development, you feel like you are going to, you have a chance to be in a position and, you know, you're not going to get this type of schedule break um, very often. Yeah. Well, yeah. The combination yeah. of the portal, the returners, and, you know, high profile signees like Jonathan Paler, Terrell Anderson at really important positions in 2024 playmakers. It, it just, I'm not saying it feels like a perfect storm, but there's a lot more going for state than it's going against state right now. So I, I don't know. I think anything, you know, 10 wins at least, I, I think is a, is a, mm -hmm. whether you get your 10th in a bowl game or bust, I can't imagine that anybody in that locker room and, and nobody's going to have more pressure or put more pressure on themselves and Dave Gordon and staff. They know what's at stake. 
Uh, you don't, I mean, you don't add these type of pieces like Grayson McCall, one of the best transfer quarterbacks in the country. Jordan Water State got a first hand view of him last year when he ran all over him. Um, and then we can go down the list Noah Rogers, all these guys, unless you're trying to make a move. And it is a race right now. It is so important for NC State in the realignment era that we're going through. And the ACC, you know, that's a you know, topic for another time. It is. It's on life support, and it's going to come to an end, I think, sooner than later. So what do you need to do? You need to win in the two big sports. You did it in basketball this year. If you could piggyback off of that and carry that momentum over and, and win in football, it would go a long way towards making you much more attractive um, when these things really heat up. Because I think an important thing for NC State fans to really think about keeping in the back of your mind is this realignment's coming, and it's going to come faster than you think. Because as soon as Clemson and Florida State – can figure how to get out of the ACC, and they eventually will. I think everybody would agree with that. Then it's going to create a huge domino effect. The ACC, for the most part, I don't know how it wouldn't be. It'll be done when those two schools leave. It's just going to create a an avalanche. And you know, it may not be yet tomorrow, two weeks from now. But I, I think that is really something to keep at. You have to do what is best for NC State, and what is best for NC State right now is to win in both sports and win a lot, mm -hmm. and then look forward and keep in the back of your mind, okay, where can we where can we go? What is going to make the most sense for us? Because, and I'm sure Boo Corgan is three, thinking three steps ahead. Every AD right now has to be. Um, because, again, the ACC is on board time. I was going to say, if you, can go to the, uh, if you can go to the SEC and say, hey, we just made the Final Four and we made the college football playoff, uh, you at least made the ACC championship yeah. game. Yeah. I mean, and I think the thing you talk about that, we talk about realignment on a whole other thing. I, you keep hearing NC State and Carolina together, and I'm sitting there thinking in the back of my mind, both of those schools need to look out for each other. I mean, not don't yeah. need to look out for each other. They need to look out for themselves because I, yeah. as much as you like that State-Carolina rivalry, you can still play that game in football. Um, if you are not able to get into the SEC or Big Ten, you are going to be fighting a major uphill battle to stay mm -hmm. competitive. From a financial standpoint, those two conferences, TV revenue alone, I think is going to double the others. I saw what the projection of $100 million compared to 50. I mean, that's, you're not even going to be able to, I mean, how do you compete? I mean, the, the coaching staff that these, you'll be able to hire, the facilities, and eventually being able to figure out how to fund this money into NIL, which I'm sure is the next deal. You know, down the road, there's going to be a way. To, to put this money into the players because I think at some point the players are going to have to become, I don't know, are they employees or what are they? Because the current model right now, and we're going out in a rabbit hole, is not sustainable for anybody. And, um, again, the ACC, not to be Debbie Downer, I, I don't think it's going to – it's not for long. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, again, I think that's – you know, we've, we've talked about it a few times on this podcast. We've talked about it a few times elsewhere. Uh, this feels like, again – you know, if NC State and UNC don't go to the same place, they're probably going to end up going to two separate places with, you know, maybe a Virginia school in tow or a, uh, you know, or a, a, a Clemson in tow with them. One I don't the view that as a make or break thing that a lot of people do. And there's a lot of powerful people who are going to have a say in that. I just, is that even the best thing? Is Would it be the worst thing in the world for State to go to the SEC if, if Alford and Carolina go to the Big Ten or vice versa? I don't know. I mean, I, I think yeah. that. At the end of the day, you have got to be extremely selfish in the age of college. I say college sports, but let's just call it what it is. This is college football driving this bus. And you talk about the importance of basketball. At the end of the day, basketball is only going to carry so much weight. Football is, is the catalyst. And, you know, that is why this season is so important for NC State. Um, if you go out and you underperform, you're going to really back yourself into a corner, I think. And, I just don't think they can afford to do that. I expect NC State to be a really good football team this year. I think everybody does, especially the schedule. You can only play, like they say, who's on your schedule. And, you know, they should be a favorite in, what, 10 out of 12 games, I would think, if, if you yeah. started yeah. today, wouldn't they be? And that, Cle and that you know, Clemson, is Clemson Clemson anymore? I mean, State's beaten them, what, two out of three years? Two out of the last three years. Uh, yeah, yeah, so you're not scared of them. them on the road now. You know, and I'm I don't haven't followed Tennessee that closely, but I don't view them as as a as the Tennessee of what thirty years ago. Um, they're I'm sure they're really talented. They got a really talented young quarterback, but you look at State's roster, and there's no reason to think you don't have a fifty fifty shot in that game. Um, 
it's a neutral site game, which I think makes it a lot much easier for NC State. Um, rather than going to play in front of, what, 100,000 people in Knoxville would probably be significantly more difficult. Uh, again, you know, in the perfect world, if you split Clemson and Tennessee, uh, you know, the dream scenario would be to win both. But if you could somehow find a way to split that, that those two matchups, I think that would be, you know, that'd be not ideal, but it would be, it'd be good. Yeah, you'd still be looking at a potential playoff berth in the 12th playoff 12 well, team playoff era yeah and i think uh, Ari, what is more important to win from a conference standpoint obviously you know tennessee do, i mean tennessee doesn't hold any weight but natural national perception if tennessee were to go on and win nine or ten games that would be a huge deal for nc state yeah. Um, yeah you can probably get to the championship game at whatever seven and one i think that would get you there but um I don't know. Uh, I, that's it's a really tough question, given the the strength of NC State schedule or lack thereof on paper. You can't afford to lose, man. I mean, more than probably one game in the ACC to have any type of shot uh, to to get into the playoff. Yeah. If you can beat Clemson and have the tiebreaker over them, that that puts you in a pretty good spot. To, to yeah, get the I mean, it's because everybody's already bashing the ACC up and down about how bad it is. It's just crazy. <laughs> you think about how bad they talked about the basketball programs. What? seven or eight weeks ago and what was it two teams were going to get in and you know things are never as bad as they seem and they're never as good as they seem I, i've never bought in in to the acc being bad in basketball um but it's it's an easy narrative and it was easy for people to piggyback on i think the a similar thing has happened to the acc in previous years uh my question is maybe this year you've got a lot of returning quarterbacks and i think that is could be maybe a some type of catalyst that maybe not changes the national perception but at least helps it some uh you got a lot of proven guys and i think at the end of the day that is if you don't have a quarterback you have no shot and a lot of these teams you know seem to have quarterbacks so we'll see well we uh we're gonna have plenty of uh opportunity here in the coming months to discuss yeah. uh more football and and uh we've got a celebration over at the brick uh excuse me the brickyard the bell tower uh that uh we're gonna try to uh, hop in on uh, here in just a second, but uh, Michael, I really do appreciate you uh, taking some time to to join us and discuss, you know, some of the spring football discussion. Um, fantastic stuff, as always. Really appreciate it. Yeah, guys, thanks for having me. Look forward to jumping back on before football season. Y'all do a great job. Appreciate you. Well, man. you're you're the one doing the great job. I mean, we're, I'm we're, just we're just, <laughs> just do, trying to do my part. Ninety percent <laughs> is showing up. So, well, that's right. Exactly. No, Especially when the teams are in the and final. The way four. things are right now, I'm more convinced ever than ever. Ninety percent, literally, is just showing up. So, oh yeah. So we're trying to trying to really give it to you. The, the last ten percent, I'm. But no, I, I appreciate it. that means a lot. So, y'all sure. have a good evening. Thanks again for having me. We'll talk soon, guys. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Thank and uh, for Corey, this is James saying so long here on the Pack Pride Weekly Podcast. Oh, thanks, Mike. I'm, I'm always weird. <laughs> uh.